I have, I have medications that I think are more applicable broadly, and I have medications that um, are more applicable per disorder. So talking about just the broad ones, you can think of sleep medications as acting in four quadrants. This is how I was trained by a sleep doctor um, who did lectures for the psychiatry residency. But you can think of GABA mechanism, generally speaking. You can think of the uh, melatonin mechanism. You can think of the cholinergic system. And you can think of the histamine system. Four major categories. Um, unfortunately, one of my favorites does not actually work in the GABA category. It's just called GABA, gabapentin. Um, technically, it's more like working, and as far as I'm aware, more like a mood stabilizer in terms of sodium channel stuff. Based on that, I try not to do cholinergic, obviously, for the side effect profile and the uh, sneaky, not sure if it's true, higher risk of dementias long term. Uh, I, I just try to avoid it. So what, what, what am I left at? Well, it's histamine agents, right? And it's gabapentin, not as habit forming as the benzos and Z drugs. And there's melatonin. Uh, which I actually try not to rely on. I, I think it's a problem with our regulation of melatonin in the United States. Uh, and then there's actually a mechanism I haven't described, which is um, agents which seem to have a profile similar to a low-dose serical, meaning agents that have mixed effects on histamine, uh, serotonin receptors, and alpha receptors. So what's like that? Well, you have your mirtazapine, right? And you have your trazodone are the most commonly available ones. Now, I don't like to make patients gain weight. So what am I left with? The broadly applicable medications for sleep in most to all disorders are therefore hydroxyzine, trazodone, and gabapentin. And melatonin is the runner up because it's not regulated and it kind of depends on which one you buy. Hydroxyzine is more of a regular old antihistamine, but we have to be careful of hydroxyzine because it definitely has anticholinergic properties, especially the higher you go. Um, so from a standpoint of treatment of sleep, I mean, that's helpful. You get the old mechanism, but also side effects, right? So it's definitely not my favorite one. Um, antihistamine agents are also much more sedating for some patients than others. This can go based on race as well. So really, I, I don't like to give hydroxyzine actually as an anti-anxiety medication. I think it's overly sedating for most people um, during the daytime. So I almost exclusively use it for nighttime dosing. But it's not the first one I reach for. The first one I reach for is trazodone because it's got a lot of additional effects. Uh, in my opinion, it's effective also for things like nightmare suppression and trauma disorders and uh, anxiety to some extent. Uh, it's very sedating. It helps uh, promote the uh, maintenance of sleep, not just the onset. But it's tricky because uh, you have to know that it's very long lasting and people can be either insensitive to it or very sensitive. So I actually start incredibly low. I start at half a tablet of the 50 milligrams most of the time and have people try that. And I tell them to take it one or two hours before their desired bedtime because and, and I do give instructions that they should find the timing that works for them. And then there's Benadryl, which is just way too anticholinergic, in my opinion. So I don't like to use that uh, unless I'm looking for anticholinergic in conjunction with a antipsychotic that's being used for a primary treatment of something like a schizophrenia or bipolar one disorder. People, people go like, oh, mirtazapine, Seroquel, you know, it's a low dose. It shouldn't be bad. I find that even at low doses, there's considerable appetite increase and weight gain for both uh, of those medications. So I avoid them. Uh, interestingly, I don't really see that with trazodone or hydroxyzine. At least if it's happening, it's more mild. Um, does it mean I don't use Seroquel or mentazapine? No, I still use them, but I use it sparingly. I try to uh, exhaust the other possibilities first. And I find that most of the time I don't need to go to uh, Seroquel or mentazapine. Now, if there's someone that has no concerns about weight gain or if they're even underweight and they want to be gaining some weight, um, and they want help with that, then yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to give those medications. Depression, as you know, changes sleep in at least two possible ways, right? And uh, it's oversimplifying, but we'll say there's sleep initiation problems or early awakening versus oversleeping, right? So we're going to leave aside oversleeping at this point because uh, that would be sleeping too much, or I could give a medication for that. But um, 
it's either early awakening, problems falling asleep, or both. And often it's both, which is why I prefer to go to Trazodone first. Again, for the maintenance issue and its efficacy for onset. And um, additionally, if they can, uh, if they're not very sensitive to Trazodone, they can take very high dose. I can take it up to 200 plus, and now it's an antidepressant too. So it's it's got a nice uh, uniform avoids polypharmacy um, or too much polypharmacy benefit there. But doxepin is very similar, actually. And I think if I think a patient is appropriate for doxepin, then that's a very similar choice in my mind. If you think about dream theory, it's kind of interesting, right? If we don't imagine dreams to be some, you know, coincidence of the brain, then why are people dreaming more in depression? Are they trying to process something and they're failing to, right? And then when you suppress it, are you just short-circuiting the processing and treating the symptoms? Uh, this is all nearly pseudoscience, by the way. It's just something that I think is a little bit fun to think about. Um, because in my opinion, most dreams actually have quite a lot of meaning. Um, but it, I wouldn't avoid an antidepressant for that reason. My little fan theory, not going to be studied, I don't think, is that what's happening in REM sleep for people who are in a uh, major depressive state is what's happening with their mind in the awake state. They're stuck. They're ruminating. They're cycling instead of appropriately emotionally processing, even within the dreams, even the unconscious. And that by uh, sort of breaking them out of that cycle, they're able to do new things during the daytime, uh, rewire themselves, if you will, and uh, get out of that. And, and that is part of the treatment approach that I have for doing sleep in depression. I don't just want them sleeping more. I want them starting to get into a, a habit of sleeping at night and being active during the day. I, I try to build that into the uh, behavioral activation component and you know, making sure that they're well rested. If you're not well rested, I, I think it is actually unreasonable for us to expect people to start doing the exercise and daytime activities and sunlight exposure and socialization. So let's get them rested first. So bipolar is easier in a sense, right? In that the primary thing that you're trying to do is achieve mood stabilization. So obviously you want to try a mood stabilizer first. Um, that being said, uh, there's a directional effect where if you disrupt the sleep of someone with a bipolar disorder, they're more likely to cycle, right? So if that's the case, then I also want to stabilize the sleep. Uh, for example, lithium might take up to two weeks to really start kicking in, right? Um, I'm not going to rely on that. So I definitely give sleep. And for a severe bipolar disorder, it's one of the few conditions where I personally uh, might consider a benzo earlier or even as a long-term agent. I try to avoid that because, again, they do have their own side effects and problems and they have the dependency issue. But some people with a primary bipolar disorder can only really be maintained well with a benzo long-term. Uh, it's still a minority. But what I do is then I will use the mood stabilizer in conjunction with one of these sleep uh, agents. But I'm much more likely to reach for gabapentin. Um, and some of you may know that gabapentin enjoyed more uh, enthusiasm earlier in the 2000s um, as an agent for bipolar disorders. And why not? It's the it's an anti-epileptic drug at sufficient doses, right? There's got to be something going on. It's got a mechanism that makes you kind of wonder about that as well. And it's pretty well tolerated and not a lot of side effects. You don't have to do blood draws. So I, I tend to reach for it. And I find it pretty effective as well. Um, some people need a very high dose to get effect from it, but uh, it seems to work well and is well tolerated. The Cochrane reviews have concluded there's no evidence. Um, I would say that based on the mechanism and clinical practice, it's a hit and miss medication, but worth using um, because of the considerations of risk compared to other agents. It's always at best a adjunctive treatment, right? And it's adjunctive treatment only for things like anxiety and um, insomnia in the bipolar disorder. It's not the primary treatment. It should not be confused for the primary treatment. Some people find 300 milligrams to be nothing. Some people will find it to be overly sedating. Um, at least for my clinical population, I'll start with 300 and I'll say, um, if it's not enough, go to 600 and call me. And if it's way too much, call me and I'll send you 100s. So uh, basically starting on 300 and then titrating to effect. 
Uh, if they use daytime cannabis, I will give them additional doses to take PRN during the daytime, but specifically in place of using the cannabis. I'm saying I'm giving you this to use this when you have a craving for cannabis, try using this instead and let's see how you do. I generally don't avoid second generation as a rule, but obviously I would second generation antipsychotics. I'd prefer to maintain someone with bipolar disorder on mood stabilizers alone if I can. Obviously, that's not feasible a lot of the time, and you're going to see uh, depressive episodes sometimes, even without uh, if you're not going for a effective second generation antipsychotic um, for some patients. But uh, you know, it's just a matter of the side effect profile, the level of risk that you're giving the patient based on the medication. For the psychosis, um, you treat the psychosis, and as long as you're dosing the medication appropriately at the right time, you will help both the psychosis and the sleep. I find that um, earlier career uh, psychiatrists and residents sometimes will maintain their habits from inpatient and do things like give Risperdal BID, you know, giving it both in the morning and the nighttime or doing that with Haldol. Um, not necessary, right? You can dose it all at night. That's fine. And you're going to help them stay active and less sedated during the daytime. And, uh, more sleeping better during the night. Now, obviously, that's patient to patient. Some patients do do better on twice a day dosing. It just kind of depends. But I find that to be uh, the exception. In the trauma disorder, you do have what seems to be the neurobiological disruption of the sleep process. You you kind of wonder about the dream mechanism getting dysregulated or problematic, just like in major depression, because why are people having recurrent nightmares of a trauma? How does that help you? Well, that seems pretty unusual compared to, you know, what we'd like for people anyway. And it's extremely distressing, right? People become afraid to go to sleep in this condition because of how bad the nightmares can be. And uh, if your sleep's messed up, well, your mood's going to be messed up and you're not going to be able to make the necessary changes to recover from the trauma disorder in your day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, returning slowly to safe places and um, acquiring new safe experiences with people and environments is what you need in a trauma disorder. So you really, really need to treat the sleep first, in my opinion, for the trauma disorder. And now you could wait several weeks sometimes or longer and try to rely solely on your SSRI. I think that's less effective and you don't need to do that. So Trazone is one of my big picks uh, because, again, can be a little helpful for nightmare stuff. Uh, prazosin, as you know, even with this mixed evidence, I see a lot of clinical efficacy. Uh, just watch that blood pressure. Um, it's nice when the patient has hypertension, and then you can just give the prazosin at the same time. Uh, you could think about things like clonidine. I don't use it myself. I find that its effects on blood pressure are a little too strong, and it's not necessarily that effective. I have found gabapentin actually to be more efficacious in um, some people for nightmares related to traumas and sleep disruptions related to traumas uh, than you might expect. Um, but that's very case to case. Some people don't respond to it at all. So just switch agents and pick one uh, that works. You can, of course, use your hydroxyzine, your sericals, your mirtazapine. Uh, theoretically, high dose mirtazapine has more noradrenergic effect, could potentially worsen nightmares. But that, that's theoretical. Well, I tell all the patients with trauma disorders that the medication is supporting their treatment, but that the primary treatment is the things that they're doing in their lives and the psychotherapy if they're willing to engage with it, right? I think that's the key. You have to be clear about what we have that has an effect. Uh, you know, you can help someone regress to the mean faster with just the SSRI, but really the treatment is the psychotherapy. And what's the first stage in the Janet model for trauma treatment is safety, right? And, you know, you can offer skills, but if you don't specifically address their sense of safety and the safety of their environment and the safety or trust that they have with you in the treatment, uh, just giving a handout's not going to go very far, right? So you gotta have the attention to that first. Thanks for watching. This video was clipped from the Psycho Farm podcast. The Psycho Farm podcast is a podcast with Dr. Fu and Dr. Malsberg, where they talk about psychiatric diagnoses, psychiatric medications, and general trends in the field. If you found this video helpful, definitely consider checking out the podcast. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and here on YouTube. Thanks for watching.